I went to an archaeology fair <laughs> in Williamson County, and uh, so I came out and volunteered for a while and just never left. Uh, my name is Steve Howard. Uh, I'm the field director here at the Galt site. Originally, the Galt site was a, a looter's uh, area. I believe it was the 1920s uh, when they first started doing it, but one of the uh, early owners decided to, to uh, capitalize on that and turned it into a pay-to-dig operation. So it was a pay-to-dig operation for quite some time. So it's been known to have been productive uh, for them for quite a long time. Uh, and it was known to have Clovis points and things like that that came out of it, which are uh, some of the oldest points in North America. I believe it changed hands at some point, either the 80s or the 90s, and, and the, the new owners had stopped the pay-to-dig operation. Um, but they continued to do a little digging around their property and they were digging at one point and found the remains of a Columbian mammoth. And so they contacted Dr. Collins, who was at UT at the time, and uh, he came out and took a look at it and found that uh, it was a pretty significant site, a pretty significant find at the site. So that's when uh, Dr. Collins got involved with the project. I'm Michael Collins. I'm a research professor at Texas State University in the Department of Anthropology. I'm also a research associate at the Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory at uh, University of Texas at Austin. I am president of a nonprofit organization called the Galt School of Archaeological Research that uh, is sort of the uh, operational arm of the Galt Archaeological Project. This site came to my attention when I was uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, and that was actually in the fall of 1990 and uh, a navigational archaeologist that was digging out here found some uh, small smooth pebbles with engraving on them associated with Clovis age artifacts and this was an unprecedented find that uh, none of us had ever heard of before. At that time this property was a pay to dig uh, locality and uh, we managed to get permission to come out here and just visit it. This was, uh, when I say we, it was Professor Tom Hester at the University of Texas at Austin and myself came out, visited the site, and decided that it was an important enough site that we'd like to do some scientific work here. And so in the summer of 1991, we arranged to do two weeks of archeological testing here with uh, students from UT Austin, which we did. And what we found told us that there was still an awful lot of important material to be found and awful lot of good information to be gleaned from this site. But we could not work with that landowner and it was 1998 before we were back on this site when the, when the site changed hands, actually. Well, in Texas archaeology, uh, the Galt site is the largest, in fact, this is North American archaeology, the largest Clovis site anywhere. It has the largest number of artifacts of, from the Clovis period. Um, and uh, one of the things that intrigues me about this place is that we have the Clovis levels. Uh, we dug a lot, down a little bit further, and there's more stuff down there. And we're trying to figure out what that stuff might be. It is one of the earlier archaeological sites to have been professionally excavated in the state of Texas. By, it was dug by J.E. Pierce in 1929 under the auspices of the Anthropology Department at the University of Texas, which is what it was at that time. And um, he demonstrated that it was one of the very largest and in terms of artifacts, one of the richest sites anywhere in central Texas. Uh, no other professional archaeologist that we know of was back on this site until 1988. And by 1988, it had become a pay-to-dig place, and it was, it, it looked like the proverbial World War I battlefield. It was, it was just virtually destroyed. And we assumed that it had no archaeological value left. So we were surprised in 1991 when we had the opportunity to test the site that it had a, a very extensive amount of early archaeological deposits that were still in place that had not been disturbed. Since 1998, 
uh, we've put in uh, a number of years of intensive investigation of those early deposits here. And they are contributing to a better understanding of the peopling of the Americas, the earliest peoples to be in the interior of North America. So the, the site's uh, continuing to make history. Clovis is a, uh, a, it's a technology uh, that's associated with people who were here uh, in North America, um, dated pretty, pretty closely to uh, between 13,000 and 13,500 years ago, somewhere around there. Uh, and for, longest, for, for a very long time, they've been considered to be the oldest uh, occupation of North America. So they were, they were the first people to come over here, according to the, to the uh, research that was done in the past. And then uh, more recently, we found that there are a lot more, uh, there's more and more evidence that people were here earlier than the 13,500 year mark. Um, and it's not clear if that's just people who developed into Clovis or if it was different people or what's going on. And that's, that's one of the things that we're trying to figure out here is, is who are these people who are there where they shouldn't be. I, I started here in 2009, so we've been here, we've actually been here since 2007. Um, uh, this site has been dug quite a bit. Uh, there's a trench that actually is right behind here, and there's a couple other trenches that go across the field here and there. Um, but they chose this site because um, they had put a, a, a one by one square meter uh, unit down as far as they could go at the time down to the water table. Uh, and they did encounter some of some flakes and stuff below uh, where the Clovis stuff w had stopped. So there's the Clovis level, and then there's a, a little level that has very little in it uh, culturally, and then the flakes start picking up again. And so uh, Dr. Collins thought, well, you know, this might be something that, that is interesting to look at. So that's what we've done here. And we're finding the same thing. I mean, we're finding the Clovis level uh, and then artifact uh, frequency drops off uh, below that for about 30 centimeters or so, and then it starts picking up again. Well, in the first place, uh, it's in a diverse region. It's close to the Balcones Escarpment, which basically runs right along by I-35 out there, the boundary between the Edwards Plateau and the Gulf Coastal Plain. And there's a boundary, there's, a, there's also a contrast in environments between this valley floor and the plateau surface around us. And wherever you have those closely spaced uh, contrasting environments, you have a greater array of resources in easy uh, walking distance. Uh, so you can, you have, you have uh, uh, greater resources close at hand than if you're out in the middle of the plateau or out in the middle of the Gulf Coastal Plain or what have you. This one also has, geologically, an enormous outcrop of very high quality flint, or we call it chert, for stone tool making. And right in this stretch of uh, Buttermilk Creek Valley, there are small but reliable springs that have not quit flowing through all the droughts we've had since the 1890s. So you've got diverse food resources, you've got stone tool material, you've got reliable water, and those add up to being an ideal place for humans uh, that, that have to live off the land. Uh, the single most interesting thing we have found is a, uh, a small area of the site where there were we, we did a, an excavation block where we opened up an area and took it down. And we happened to come right down on an artificial stone pavement, a square patch of gravel that's about seven feet by seven feet, oriented by the cardinal directions. And it had a very thin, sparse layer of archaeological material on and around that floor. Archaeologists have a concept that we call the toss zone. And Boy Scouts have toss zones, Australian Aborigines have toss zones. Uh, and what that is, if you've got a central area in a campsite and you generate trash, you just toss it off to one side or the other. And what you end up with 
is usually a kind of a clean area with arcs of trash around them. There are two toss stones, two arcs of trash around that stone pavement. One of them is uh, small chips of uh, flint or chert, the results of stone tool manufacture. And they are on the north, northeast, and east side of that stone pavement. And on the west, southwest, and south side of it are uh, bones of large animals. A lot of them couldn't be identified, but the few that could be were uh, bison or buffalo bones. We found just a very small number of kind of nondescript stone tools on that surface. And we interpreted those tools as belonging to Clovis culture of about 13,000 years ago. But we've recently gotten back some dating results that suggest that that stone floor may be 15 or more thousand years old, quite a lot earlier than Clovis. So we are currently in the process of much more intensively dating samples that will help pin down the age of that. And if it does prove to be as old as we think it is, uh, that will be the first really large intact human feature found in the Western Hemisphere uh, that, uh, that's older than Clovis. There were similar things found in, um, at the site of Monte Verde in southern Chile a number of years ago, uh, but they're not, they don't seem to be quite as old as this. So those two sites suggest a pretty uh, complex cultural level existing here earlier than anyone was willing to accept just a few years ago. Uh, we find uh, mostly flakes, which is what you're going to find in, in any context like this. Uh, we have found uh, what are called uniface tools, which are, uh, well, they're called blades, and they're uh, very Clovis. Clovis is, this is one of the technologies that are associated with Clovis is, uh, these long, narrow blades that are, that are struck from a core that's prepared to make blades that are of that long, uh, narrow shape. Okay, and we are finding some of those in the lower levels as well, which, you know, indicates that it can either be, you know, earlier Clovis or, you know, a shared technology with the earlier uh, technology that's there. Uh, one thing that we're not finding so far in the lower levels is fluted points, which is another characteristic of Clovis. Um, and that's something that's not shared with Salutrian, uh, for the most part. There's, there's, uh, the fluted technology seems to, to have occurred in North America, and not, not anywhere else. So like, I'm, I'm very interested in finding, uh, in a site like this, uh, organic material, which might not sound exciting, but uh, organic material rarely uh, survives in this context. So when we find charcoal, that's awesome. We can date it. Uh, we had a large earth oven that we dated uh, to about 8,000 years ago, which is one of the older earth ovens in Texas. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, we found a deer antler uh, a little bit lower than that in context with Angostura uh, era artifacts. The biggest surprise was finding uh, bifaces down below where the the, the lowest level ship were supposed to be. So, uh, so we have some, some pretty interesting bifaces from, from below what's known as the Clovis level. And we're, we're trying to figure out what they are. So it's pretty exciting. The problem is, again, we're not finding fluted points down below yet. It's not to say we won't, but we haven't found any yet. So we have found uh, bifaces, um, mainly uh, incomplete bifaces or, or uh, uh, preform bifaces. Uh, these are just artifacts that have been chipped on both sides to, uh, on their way to becoming a tool. Uh, and then we found some, some pretty interesting whole tools um, that we haven't been able to have a... Uh, uh, we've had a lot of people look at them and, and nobody's been able to, to say for sure what they are. So they, they seem to be something new. So we're looking into it and seeing what they are. This was found earlier today uh, in those lower levels. Uh, 
so I can uh, just show you that real quick. And so for the most part, something like this is going to be fairly nondescript. And a lot of them are like that. And what we're looking for are uh, what we call diagnostic artifacts, things that, that uh, can be compared to uh, other things to try to uh, give it a, uh, a date in comparison to other things, a relative date. Okay, but something like this, uh, you know, the, there's no telling what time period this would be from because there's no characteristics that tell you, well, this is from this particular time period. So they had a very good natural environment here. They made the most of it. And that makes this a laboratory for the study of human adaptability. And there, this site and dozens of others contribute evidence to piecing that kind of story together for this region. I think it's a hell of a story. This project has uh, relied on students and volunteers for almost all of the 20 years that I've been working on it with a very small paid staff uh, directing and coordinating all of those efforts. Most of our funding has come from private foundations and individual donors which, uh, when this project was run out of uh, University of Texas at Austin for a number of years. University of Texas at Austin provided uh, space and infrastructure for us, but no direct funding per se. We have precisely the same relationship now at Texas State University, where uh, they are providing us with workspace and um, uh, some infrastructure we have to generate our own funding. And uh, right now, we have one National Science Foundation grant that's helping pay for some of the special studies that we are pursuing. And then we've got uh, individual donors have uh, provided most of our funding uh, of late. One thing that uh, we've made an effort to do with our GALT project is do as much public outreach as we can. We, we maintain this site uh, in, in a ready mode to receive uh, visitors, tour groups, school kids. Uh, we go and give talks whenever and wherever we're invited. Uh, we want the public, not just the people of Central Texas, but anybody who will listen, we want them to know about the past of this region and how interesting it, it is, especially as we face hard choices in climate change today, Texas has been on average drier than it is in recent history for 8,000 of the last 12,000 years. So there's got to be some lessons learned about how people adapted to those conditions in the past that'd be useful to us in the future. So, uh, we're, we want to make this place relevant to uh, anybody who's interested in listening.